Inventative Indians and Krishma Sadani. And today I'm joined by a panel that is going to debate on the topic Is toppling of statues an acceptable form of protest? Well, the statues have stood for more than a century in some places. Some are cast in bronze, others carved in stone. And all over the world, the protests against the socioeconomic concerns and aspects have emerged where people have have been asking that does this statue still need to be there? Now, various reports and certain deep diving stories have uh, been there out on the web talking about the tearing down a statue. And of course, it speaks of toppling to be seen as a destruction of cultural heritage in a lot of interpretations. Let me take a back seat and uh, get my set of brilliant panelists today who will be leading this uh, conversation. Uh, uh, it's a good evening from India, but uh, it's a very diverse set of panelists who are joining us uh, today. I'm joined by Dr. John Robert Klammer, who's from Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities. I have Dr. Cherian Alexander, Professor, Department of English, St. Joseph's College. Dr. Kathleen A. Modrosti, Dean and Professor, Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities. Dr. Deepak Mehta, Professor of Sociology, Ashoka University, and soon to join will be Dr. Johanna Burke Brown, Senior Lecturer, Department of Philosophy, University of Bristol. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this panel. And uh, let's start off by, of course, sharing a few opening remarks on this uh, topic. Uh, and I must um, start off uh, with uh, uh, Kathleen, who also has a presentation for us. Uh, on this, I'd request the technical team to put it uh, up. And before we go on that, I think the question to start off uh, is uh, that, uh, what do these attacks on statues in recent times tell us about the protests themselves? Over to you, Dr. Mudruski. Okay, um, thank you. I think that you will probably uh, understand, and because we have such a variety of panelists that uh, statues aren't neutral, public space isn't neutral, and different statues, different public spaces have different meaning. Uh, what you see here is the statue that I think made a lot of publicity uh, because it was the statue that was thrown into the bay in, uh, um, in the UK, in uh, Bristol. And this is something that, you know, people began talking about, but let's go to the next one. I just wanted to, so this is the different types of iconoclasm, of course, throwing statues, toppling statues, occupying space, um, defacing different, uh, you know, different uh, created images. It has a way, it's a way of claiming symbolic space. Uh, it is a way of, it can be an act of political zeal, you know, showing that this is our energy, this is what's happening, this is what we're taking over. Uh, outrage, and we certainly see outrage occurring uh, in the Black Lives Matter. It has multiple meanings as well, but it's the way of going public, taking over a public place and signaling, the fourth point, signaling regime change signaling that it's not going to be business as usual. We're not going to accept this anymore. Now um, we can have the next slide, okay? So I wanted to go with some of the images that we, you know, we all know about. I mean, we know that toppling statues is something that's occurred since Egyptian times and probably much earlier than that. This is an interesting case is the Bamiyan Buddhas that were erected. They started the erection in 544 and in, 20, uh, in 2003, I think, or, uh, the, the Buddhas, 2001, were detonated by dynamite. So this was the Taliban that claimed uh, their they claimed uh, responsibility for it. Now, this is where the public image comes into play. This is where toppling statues also is a way to gain the attention of the public. 
uh, we have certain iconic medium, media images that are very important. And it's one way for people who have not shown their position, they have been considered voiceless, non-existent, to demonstrate who they are and what they are. Uh, you know, David Harvey has said that public spaces are never neutral. Public spaces in general are patriarchal. Uh, they also eventually become the space where those who have have taken over and control a certain group. So public space and also about images, statues in public spaces, uh, carry on the same meaning. I do want to say something interesting about the Bamiyan uh, conflict, which probably everyone's aware of, but uh, it had two different reasons were given. One was given by uh, Mala, uh, Omar, who said that when the Swedish, I'm, I'm sorry, where the representative Rutala from the Taliban said it was in reaction to the Swedish delegation who came to uh, Afghanistan and offered to put money into restoration of this, uh, this site of Bamiyan, whereas the call had been to provide food and nourishment for the people of Afghanistan who were starving. On the other hand, um, well, Omar said that the Taliban had to destroy these statues in the name of Islam. Well, you know, there are certain contradictions there too, but I'm not going to go into it. So what this really shows is that you can have multiple purposes for toppling statues. And the group that has the power to do it also is the group that's going to receive the publicity, be able to get their image put forward. Uh, could we have the next one? Slide. Okay, I think everyone knows this one. It's the toppling of the statue of Saddam Hussein in Firdal Square in Baghdad. And this was 2003. This was right after the American troops came into Baghdad. The fights were still raging. And uh, Saddam Hussein had set up these public images really all over the country. So on one hand, they were not it definitely uh, something that was accepted by the entire population. But this particular event underscored the power of media and the power of the press. And it also was a setup. Uh, whereas lots of different Im instances were taking place all over Baghdad, all over other places where people were showing uh, their joy at the you know destruction of the stat the statues the fall down of the government you know they would also topple statues or start hitting statues with their shoes etc this particular event which captured the public imagination because it was all over the press was actually constructed and it was set up with the assistance of the army the US army there and uh, bringing in people from you know, different areas of the city to help pull down the statue. And they couldn't do it. Um, there are lots of photographs, if you've gone through it, of people trying to hack it down. It didn't happen. You can see the hack mark. But <clears throat> this is the one that made the press. And it also shows, I think, in a very important way, the symbolic value so that the way the pictures are taken, the way that they're set up show is trying to say a message. It's the iconography of iconoclasm. I think I just have uh, one more. And this is what's going on now in my own country. Uh, there are a lot of monuments that are left. Uh, this is the the reaction to white supremacy, colonialism, and the conf in the form of the Confederacy, and the idealization of Confederate values. This Black Life Matters program, though, 
can also be seen as anti-colonial. You can see uh, in South America, what's been happening in Peru and Bolivia, uh, South Africa, of course, with the, the actions that were taken and um, the you know, taking down of roads, statues, et cetera. So all the symbols of the life that came before are not being obliterated. I do not believe that toppling statues is a way of destroying history. I feel it's a way of claiming the space. Uh, in the United States, for example, and I just put a few statistics here, that the number of Confederate statues of proclaiming Robert E. Lee and other uh, heroes, and I put that into heroes into um, a questionable space of the Civil War is a way of saying that portraying the loneliness of the forgotten. It kind of speaks right now to the fact that there's tremendous economic disparity in the country. So that you have a focal point with people in certain parts of the country looking at this lost civil war, not really for anti um, the loss of the, the victory over slavery, but the fact that White people, white men especially, are losing their position of power in the country. Interestingly enough, while one would think uh, many of the people who are working within the movements to preserve the Confederacy, to preserve these ideals, are middle-aged white people, white men especially. So this is, gives you an idea of who feels attacked by the, the reaction to the ongoing values, this struggle that is being fought in the, in the United States for whose country is it, whose ideals are going to be valued. And of course, as many writers have said, uh, statues, public places aren't neutral at all. And let's have the final. Slide, please. Uh, this is the removal of Robert E. Lee statue in Charlottesville. This is, has been a site for a number of years now with uh, people protesting. There have been white supremacist uh, riots on the university campus. There also have been uh, strong reactions to this movement and the idea that we want to occupy the space by the people who should be owning this space and not the white supremacists who are represented by the outside world. So this is when eventually this is a different solution. Uh, the government after so many protests took place, this is, you know, rather than toppling the statue, it was removed by the state government. This is what's happening more and more frequently is a transformation of the space through also acquiescence on the part of local governments. And that means creating the space in a different image. Uh, and I'll show you the one more slide, I'm sorry. Okay, this one I think is really interesting because it does really show a transformation of the space. Uh, you can see that the statue of Robert E. Lee has been completely covered with uh, paint. The picture that you, you know, that you see there is um, the, the picture of George Floyd. And it is, you know, the person famous for being famous for, uh, being killed by the police, being strangled. And Black Lives Matter really took off quite a bit before this, but this was the culmination. This, this event sparked the events where, again, the question of toppling the statues uh, is also kind of a signal, a very important signal that things are changing. We're not gonna be taking it anymore. Uh, the regime has to change. We're going to 
occupy this space. I don't know, the Occupy movement, I think were very important uh, all over the world. The Occupy Wall Street started this one. And I think it goes hand in hand with the notion of toppling statues, because this is a way in which people who feel that they have a right to have their voices heard, they have a right to proclaim their values and to underscore the inequality in a, in a space and a place. The fact that these, uh, these incidents, toppling statues, occupying space, does have a significant uh, value within the runnings of a country is, you know, when you look at it, uh, uh, Trump, when he was president, claimed that anyone defacing a statue, toppling a statue, should get 10 years in prison. Boris Johnson, after a bit of nudging, um, you know, from his fellow parliamentarians, was also saying, okay, we're going to reenact the laws that you're going to have to pay in an indemnization for toppling statues, and there will be trials and jail sentences. And even Emmanuel Macron seemed to forget the history of the French Revolution, saying no statues will be removed in France. Well, that hasn't happened either. Um, there have been removals. So whether the question is, uh, is toppling statues valid? As I pointed out here, and I, I don't know if I missed the point or you got it, there are different ways of doing it. There are different voices and different participants. My own personal belief is that when the action arises from, let's say the ground up, that there is such an affront to the way in which government has taken place. Also the fissures in society have been um, really widened to such an extent that one can no longer be quiet. Then I think these demonstrations in public places in attacking uh, the representatives, let's say the iconic representatives of what is felt as uh, illegitimate values, that is a way to go about it. I do believe that having governments remove under pressure from the citizens, remove the statues is probably a, um, a stronger message. I do believe, as this image shows, transformation of the space is very significant as well, because it will be, again, with the use of social media and the iconic value of a statue of a place, will be able to tell the story or to push forward uh, an idea. I think the danger is, and this we've seen throughout the United States, the danger is the notion that this is an act, almost an act of war, and that it can propagate really further uh, kind of confrontation and become the call for battle. Okay, so those are, I, I don't know if I've gone way over my time. Thank you, Dr. Mudroski. I think uh, those were a lot of pointers, but uh, Throughout the debate, uh, we're definitely going to pick on each of them and carry forward with two important uh, uh, quotes I'm going to pick up uh, before I go to Dr. Klammer. And uh, uh, they have to be the first one where you've quoted that public spaces are not gender neutral. That is the kind of uh, perspective. And second, uh, uh, as per you, it's a way of claiming the space and not destroying history. So Dr. Klammer, I'm going to bring you in here. Would you? you agree to the statement? Well, yes, to a, to a great extent. I mean, I have to, I have to admit at the beginning, I'm, I'm not a big fan of statues. Um, but partly for reasons that, that Kathleen's pointed out. I mean, if you, if you walk around the, the city centers of you know, historic cities like London, perhaps, uh, Vienna, you know, there, there are plenty of statues of now long forgotten generals and these kind of people often, uh, long forgotten kings and queens. Who, if you if you take a critical historical approach, of course, were often the people who were you know oppressing your grandparents or creating you know 
colonial atrocity somewhere in the middle of Africa. Um, the pigeons like them, but I don't know about any, anybody else likes them very much. But but to, to I mean to take this more seriously, I mean I think I think I glad to see Professor Dr. Birch Brown has just joined us because the very first image that Kathleen showed, of course, was the, the statue of Edward Colston. I think that's his name, correct? Yeah. If I spelled it correctly, right? In Bristol, yes, in the very city of Bristol. You know, as you know, torn down and pushed into the harbour, fished out, I believe, later by the city authorities. And you know, Colston was a you know great what would you call him, one of those great civic figures, uh, you know, donator to no doubt charities and hospitals and so on in Bristol. And of course, made his money in the slave trade, which was of course, I think the basis for the, the primary objection to, you know, still allowing a statue of someone whose position now would be considered totally unacceptable, you know, to remain in a, in a, in a prominent public place. Um, but I think to build on something that Kathleen said, I, I'd just like to say, three things briefly, I think. First of all, I think it's correct to say that the public space itself has changed. You know, the kind of spaces that were policed in certain kind of ways, which were, you know, had a certain gravitas about them because they were associated with some sort of historical event. I think a lot of that has changed. I'm not sure that everybody really necessarily goes along with that kind of um, reading of how political space. And I think one of the reasons for that is of course that political culture has changed. You know, it is now possible to raise those kind of questions. And of course they're, they're uncomfortable. Kathleen mentioned the name of Rhodes, for example, now you know, we're both at the same university, as you know, and our vice chancellor was a Rhodes scholar, very prestigious scholarship, picture of Oxford for a year or however long it is. And of course there was also controversy in Oxford about Rhodes, because there's a statue of Rhodes in one of the Oxford colleges, Oriel College, I believe. And again, there were strong protests about this, the idea that his own association with, with uh, the, the colonial South Africa made it unacceptable. Uh, this was resisted, of course, in, in that case. And as far as I know, the statue at Oriel College is still there. The argument being, the counter argument being, well, this is a historical fact. And to some extent, you should, you should allow these things to remain as a kind of reminder. Uh, although, of course, that works if you realize there are alternative readings of that, those historical facts. And something is said about you know, the negative as well as the positive readings that are possible. But I think there's a third thing too, which, it, which doesn't come up here much, which I think is that also aesthetics have changed. No, I think, I think most of us would be horrified if anybody wanted to put up a statue of the kind we see around in London or somewhere, you know, in the middle of the, say, Jindal University campus or in the middle of anywhere, right? Middle of Ashoka campus or somewhere. This would be not, I mean, not only for political reasons, but because aesthetics have changed in such a way that that is no longer how representation of historical events is taking place. It's being permeated through all sorts of other media. It's through all, all sorts of all sorts of other other ways in which people, I think, are redefining their ideas of how, what what, if you like, a monument should be, or how you memorialize something or draw attention to it. And of course, there, there are very different ways of doing this. I, I taught once in a university in Germany, the, the Bauhaus University, which is a very famous university of art and architecture. And interesting for two reasons. One of my colleagues, I always enjoyed sitting next to him at Senate meetings, was the professor of monuments. And he kind of looked like this a bit himself. He was this rather antique looking chap. But I mean, monuments then didn't only mean statues, of course, they meant all sorts of forms of commemoration, such as war memorials, for example, which didn't take the form of a statue. Um, but just outside the city of Weimar, just over the hill, is one of the concentration camps from the Nazi period, Buchenwald. It's just not quite visible from the city, although it's just a short bus ride from, from downtown Weimar. As with other concentration camps, the Buchenwald camp has been retained. It, it's a lot of the camp is, of course, long since disappeared, the wooden buildings and so on, but the, the site of the camp is still there. Stone buildings are still there uh, as a form, of course, memorialization of something which happened and should be preserved to keep that memory, that negative memory, if you like, alive. So you can't see the camp from downtown Weimar. The, uh, Weimar was liberated by the Red Army. And after the liberation, one of the things the Russians did, the Soviets then, as they were then did, was to erect a statue on the ridge 
from which you can see quite clearly from downtown Weimar a statue. So even if you can't see the camp, you can certainly see the statue, which reminds you that the camp is just on the on the other slope of the hill, on the other side. So I think I think we should probably put these things together. You know, the, the changing public space, changing political culture, and also changing aesthetics. Um, and of course, as as history, as you know, I think Kathleen is totally right about this. I mean, history is a process which is going to be constantly rewritten and reinterpreted. Um, I, I haven't lived in the UK for years, but Joanna probably can confirm this. I, I believe that the statue of Winston Churchill, close to Parliament House in London, has been sort of encased in some kind of box uh, because people were also. Uh, tempted or were beginning to assault the statue of Winston Churchill. Of course, he's not necessarily a very popular person in India, whatever his, his uh, you know, reputation in Britain as the great wartime prime minister um, has been. Nevertheless, of course, that history will be constantly reread. And I, th I think we have to see the question of monuments in, in that sense. Therefore, it may be in many cases that indeed, as we saw in Eastern Europe, of course, after the end of the Soviet regime, you know, one of the first things people wanted to do was to topple statues of people like Lenin, certainly Stalin, precisely because of the very negative symbolism that those public monuments contain for them. And I, that, that's a sentiment I totally understand. Although, as Kathleen, I think, rightly says, perhaps we also reached the point at which it will now be municipal organizations which would undertake this. But if I can, if I can, if I can conclude with something I just, my, the, the main English newspaper here in, in Japan shows up with the International New York Times. And yesterday I found a very interesting little thing. There's a, there was a, an announcement in the paper about the Sackler Wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York is being renamed because of some very negative connotations now attached to the Sackler name. And this led on to a general discussion about this, about protest uh, and the way in which art museums, for example, are now becoming more and more responsible about declaring where their collections came from or where their funding comes from. But let me just read you this little thing. That was about the Met, okay? It says, and here I'm quoting from the New York Times. Similarly, when the American Museum of Natural History announced last year that it's equestrian memorial to Ted Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, which had long prompted objections as a symbol of colonialism and racism was coming down. A Roosevelt family member released a statement approving the removal. The statue is heading to a presidential library in North Dakota as a long-term loan from New York City. So again, I, I didn't understand that Teddy Roosevelt had such negative connotations for some people, but apparently he's not being destroyed. He's being moved to North Dakota where I don't think it'd be seen very much, but I rather like this idea that he's on loan um, in perpetuity probably to the North Dakotans. So I hope they can enjoy the statue. Okay, let me stop there. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Flammer. Uh, again, interesting points raised, especially on the part uh, where you said that the settings have changed, the aesthetics have changed, and that's the uh, conventional norm, the change is, uh, is, of course, something that is constant. I'm going to welcome uh, Joanna Burke-Brown. Uh, she's uh, joined us uh, here. And uh, uh, let me go to you uh, uh, to get your uh, remarks uh, on this, especially, you know, there's this general perspective uh, uh, that is being seen is that people rebel against the ideas represented by these statues. So according to you, and to get your word on it, are there other aspects of uh, tearing the statue down that people you know, may not immediately understand or consider? Mm. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, first of all, I'm so sorry for arriving late. I miscalculated the time difference. I'm very embarrassed. Uh, thank you for having me <laughs> and join you a bit late. Um, so I got involved in the, the debates around Colston in 2016 or so here in Bristol. So I've been in that conversation for many years. And when I first, um, first got interested in this, it seemed to me completely obvious that the, the great big concert venue in Bristol, the Colston Hall, should be renamed. I couldn't understand. If, I thought if you're opposed to that, you have to be a raging racist, like, why on earth would you want to go and enjoy your favorite music in a venue named after somebody who is involved in, you know, significantly involved in organizing transatlantic slavery? That's uh, 
it was, seemed unthinkable. Um, and so it seemed very, very obvious to me at first uh, that that was the right thing to do. And, and it was only really over a period of years of listening very, very carefully to what people were saying on different sides that I started to see, um, I started to see some of the nuances a little bit more around how people are impacted by those changes. It's gonna be very different country to country and situation to situation, but here in Bristol, um, lots and lots of people grew up with Colston um, as a kind of a local identifier, you know, so they were, they, it was associated with these schools that people aspired to go to and they, they went to them and then they called themselves old Colstonians and they were Colston's girls and, you know, people who'd spent eight decades feeling a sense of pride and identity in that, in that, in being a Colston's girl, um, that that is, uh, was associated for them with all of these positive values of charity and goodness and, you know, paternalistic attitudes. But there's, I guess what I began to gradually see was that there are these innocent parts of people's identities that get caught in the crossfire of these debates. You know, parts of people's identities that are about having had your first kiss at Holston Hall or seeing, um, you know, the Rolling Stones play there and that you're playing a concert as a child there and all these memories and associations. And um, people feel like there's a rug being pulled out from under them that they didn't even know they were standing on. And so there's just this kind of really, um, really very powerful associations. And sometimes they're very irrational as well. Like, just because we're not very rational people, are we? Like, you know, human beings, we're very associational. And um, so speaking with some people uh, in Bristol, there, there's a sense amongst, oh, I don't know. Like I've chatted with people who, who've said, oh, all this stuff around Colston, makes me feel so upset because I've spent my whole life working in the Muller residential home. And I said, well, M Muller family is different from the Colston family. So why are you, why do you feel there's a connection there? And they're like, oh yeah, it is different, isn't it? But still it's the same thing. And so there's kind of, there, there are all these different kind of things that people have been involved in that are feeling undermined and threatened. Um, and it's very interesting then, what do you do? What What's the way, what's the path towards changing the public symbols to become ones that express respect towards every person, but doing so in a way and with a tone and with the kind of the kinds of public communication necessary to communicate um, respect and understanding towards the people who are experiencing what, what to them feel like quite big existential losses. Um, and I think there's an artfulness there. I think it's possible to make really big changes to public space um, in ways that do communicate deep, profound respect in every direction. But it probably, it takes a lot of commitment to saying those messages. And I don't hear people doing that, mu that much. So there's not a lot of, uh, you know, if you think about like, well, for me, a reference point is in the US uh, civil rights movement, um, people who are doing the boycotts and the sit-ins, they were, constantly, constantly, every day saying, I love you, whether you agree with me or not. I'm, at, I'm taking this stance. I'm not gonna do this anymore. I'm withdrawing my cooperation, but I love you. I, I, and you can't change that. I'm gonna continue to express this fundamental respect and love. And we're too bashful to say that anymore. So we're sort of, uh, or we're too angry. So I think we, we should move away from this kind of um, emotional language of outrage as the main tenor of things. I think there's a space for that, but I think there's there's a possibility to do really, really positive changes that are expressive of respect. And I guess I'll just say one other thing with that. Um, I've been in the role of uh, co-chairing the Bristol History Commission, which was set up by the mayor of Bristol after the Colston statue came down to help the city. And the, the remit was to help the city understand uh, where we've come from so we can better decide where we are gonna go. Uh, so it's an educational, it's kind of a public pedagogy remit. Um, but one of the things that we've done is to help curate the display of the Colston statue now in the Bristol Museum, uh, the Imshed Museum. Uh, so we've taken this, the statue, put it into the Imshed Museum, and now for, for people to come and look at it and done a big survey, consultation survey, we've, we've had 14,000 people reply 
about what should happen with the Colston statue, with the plinth, et cetera. This is the biggest survey the local council has ever done. Phenomenal response, and um, we'll be announcing results from that in January. But the piece of that curation that I'm, that I'm most proud of myself and that I really focused on was how do you respectfully shape the space immediately around the statue? Uh, so that what the initially the, the initial draft of that exhibit had projected on the wall this huge projection of the figures of the um, pr the scenes from the day of the toppling, so the protesters. So that was kind of projected on the wall right up behind the statue, um, and that would have been very powerful and evocative for anybody who was there on the day who felt strongly in favor of that. Um, they might have felt very uplifted. But for all the people that I have just been describing who have those attachments to Colston and who haven't let go of that sense of um, this kind of associations that are probably quite deep, it could have just been so painful to see what, what would have been a quite a triumphalist way of presenting him. So in the end, um, I argued for a quite a neutral space around him. So just a blank wall immediately around him. You've got information elsewhere in the exhibit about the Black Lives Matter protests and placards and stuff, but immediately over him, a blank wall onto which we projected these three-part dialogues. So the three-part dialogues, one of them, would you'd have like a line that comes up that says, um, I felt euphoric when the statue came down. And then another line that says, uh, comes up and says, really, I felt horrified. And then the first one comes up again and says, for me, it was like a great weight lifted. And then a rhetorical question that said, how did you feel when the, when the statue came down? Um, and then there are like a bunch of these different dialogues, each having a look at something about the question presenting different views and starting starting and ending with different voices. So it's not always one side or the other that gets the kind of final say. And then handing it back over to the viewer to think for themselves about whether we can come together over political difference, about what's our role in this, these conversations. Um, and I think that's, that's a, an example of how you can present different views um, with a kind of handing it back to people. And, a, and it's something that communicates respect across difference and an okayness with kind of having that diversity of views that we do currently have, at least in the UK. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Now I'm going to quickly go to Dr. Mehta. And uh, this is more of a perspective again coming in that there's a, a reflexive instinct in the uh, academy for a long time that has been to preserve anything that can teach us more about, uh, uh, you know, history. Is, is, is it something, uh, is that the case, why there is so much focus on uh, preserving these uh, sculptures and idols and statues? Oh, yes, absolutely. I think that's, uh, uh, that's uh, in a sense, the remit of uh, professional historians and, uh, in a sense, uh, of uh, social scientists. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I'm completely in agreement with uh, the three, with uh, Joanna, with John and uh, Kathleen uh, in, uh, in their opinions. It just seems to me that, uh, you know, I'm asking myself, uh, when I think about statues, what exactly do I mean of, uh, by this particular term? Uh, what sorts of, uh, if you want, uh, discursive fields or what sorts of areas does it uh, occupy? And it seems to me that, at least in the case of uh, India, and I'm speaking specifically in relation to India, it's very difficult to sort of uh, mark such a sharp disting distinguishing line between a statue, a name, and a monument. I think they blur into each other. Now, there are various sorts of actors that are involved in this. Uh, uh, mainly, uh, it seems to me that the state is a very powerful actor in, uh, in iconoclasm. And it sort of uh, breaks down these uh, uh, sorts of statues. So what do statues do, in a, in a manner of speaking for myself? I think that they have a, a very powerful commemorative function. They're almost like the name. They're almost like, you know, to use a bad term, they are like rigid designators. They fix you. And it's a certain kind of freezing of time that happens when you begin to think uh, through the notion of what a statue is and what a statue is doing and, uh, and so on. And uh, in a sense, when you get, uh, say, upsurges, uh, uh, either state orchestrated or from uh, the point of view of civil society, 
uh, it's an attempt to uh, uh, break that encrusted uh, temporality that is built into uh, uh, statues. And I think that's something that uh, happens. Uh, but there are two sorts of contrasting views, or, or if you want contrasting perspectives that are involved when you begin to think about uh, the disruption of statues. Uh, both of them in very powerful ways pointing to a notion of history. Incidentally, it's in our country, it's far easier to change the past than to live in the present. It happens all the time. Uh, uh, that's something that is happening uh, uh, even as we uh, speak. Uh, but there seems to be to be two sorts of contrasting uh, opinions as far as uh, two contrasting perspectives to uh, how we begin to think of uh, this past and the pastness of this past. You can either adopt a position of, uh, as I think uh, professional historians do, of uh, thinking of the past in terms of uh, a reflective attitude of learning uh, about it, of uh, trying to develop documents, of uh, critiquing it, and so on. Now, that is, in a sense, a dry academic discourse, and it really doesn't move into uh, you know, public uh, society and public spaces and so on. But there is another and much more powerful <clears throat> way of <clears throat> thinking of the past, and this is restorative. The past is restorative, that you are going to address the ills of the past. And one of the ways of, the, the, of addressing the ills of the past is to obliterate it. Uh, now, obviously, this can't be done. We know that. But uh, uh, there is this attempt. And I think that, uh, in a sense, regimes which uh, try to uh, move towards uh, the obliteration of the past are not coincidentally also authoritarian regimes. I mean, that's, uh, that's something that uh, one finds all the time. Uh, so, you know, I know that uh, in other parts of the world, and especially in, uh, in South Africa and uh, in Atlanta and, uh, and so on, there, is a, there has been a really powerful upsurge of uh, civil, civil groups to, to reclaim uh, a certain kind of uh, past and to uh, make sure that the wounds of the past are then recognized and made visible. Uh, in the case of uh, places like uh, Giza Park in Turkey or uh, in India, or even in Tahrir Square, if you begin to look at what happens over there, uh, the strange, the interesting thing about Tahrir Square is that uh, first it's a com completely uh, empty space. It's an open space. And after uh, it's cleared, then it becomes monumentalized and the state actually produces monuments over there. So you get uh, you know, a, a peculiar way of how you begin to address uh, certain sorts of uh, movements that actually sometimes it is in the interest of the state to produce certain sorts of monuments. Uh, uh, you know, they may be torn down uh, later, that's a different matter. But uh, you know, you, 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 there is a very complicated kind of way by which one begins to think of how is public space going to be occupied and reoccupied. So uh, Kathleen's point of public space being uh, entirely symbolic, I entirely agree. I would also add that there is a way in which public space is not merely symbolic, it also becomes iconic. And uh, we have to pay much greater attention to uh, what icons do and what they condense uh, in themselves. There has been a fairly long debate uh, in, uh, in, in Delhi on uh, the canopy in India Gate, which had first uh, a statue of, uh, of a British king, uh, which was then uh, sort of uh, taken down. And uh, then the idea was, how do you begin to uh, fill it up? And uh, do you put the statue of Gandhi over there? And I thought that uh, the decision was to leave it empty and to leave it, uh, uh, to leave it an open space. And I think in a strange way, that sort of open space became hugely iconic. It just became a symbol of, uh, in a sense, of, uh, of freedom. Uh, uh, and that's, that's I think, uh, uh, really interesting. So sometimes when uh, public space is evacuated of uh, uh, statues, uh, uh, it also uh, sort of uh, shows to us uh, the possibilities of freedom. Uh, I'll just stop over there. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mehta. I'm going to open this debate and bring in Dr. Cherry and Alexander to comment on where exactly the analogy lies. Uh, uh, interesting pointer is given by all of you. Uh, uh, Dr. Alexander, you have to 
uh, take this stance where the debate lies? Is it uh, history versus values? Or uh, um, like Dr. Mehta also pointed out, is it an expression of democratic prote protest versus the lawlessness? Thank you for this opportunity. I hope I'm audible. Loud and clear. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, uh, first of all, a shout out to John Clammer. You had been only a name for me. I edited a book which had your essays from People Tree, uh, Ecocultural Resources for Sustainable Societies. Hi. <laughs> uh, right. Um, sorry for that personal note. Uh, now, the thing is, um, I, I think that in this debate so far, we've looked at it uh, from both sides, uh, you know, uh, and there's been a hesitancy to come down very heavily against one side or on one side, but the, to, uh, to realize the complexity of the situation, that uh, history is ambiguous uh, always. I'm reminded of a, uh, a line from uh, the critic Walter Benjamin, who said that uh, there is no document of civilization, which is not at the same time a document of barbarism. There is no document of civilization that is at the same time, uh, that is not at the same time a document of barbarism, which means that the, the more carefully we look at uh, the past, uh, the more complex the past becomes. And even the things that we think of as absolutely wonderful and praiseworthy will have blemishes. So there's nothing that is totally free of that. So I think an awareness of that should probably inform uh, debates about this. One can understand the uh, the sentiment, one can understand the outrage as uh, the previous speakers have mentioned, one can understand the need to revisit the past and to, uh, pre uh, re uh, to present or correct the distorted views of the past, uh, which have been uh, politically motivated, etc. And also because of new awareness of rights as, as we go forward. The thing about it is that when you look back at history, whether it's India or whether it's Africa or whether it's uh, Europe or America, uh, until uh, maybe the French Revolution and, uh, you know, until the uh, American Republic, um, the concept uh, was actually might was right. Might was indeed right for, uh, uh, for a large periods of history. And many of the people we praise, uh, you know, as heroes, uh, whose statues we still have. Like, for example, we are a democracy. The question is, we have statues of kings. Uh, in Karnataka, we have statues of, no, they were enlightened rulers, no doubt, but uh, they were autocrats, uh, you know, uh, to, to a significant extent. So do we accept that value now that we are Democrats? Uh, so the, you know, now that we are democratic in spirit. So the thing is that there are these ambiguities and we've got to deal with them. Um, now, let me just start on a personal, uh, you know, I, I, I have my five minutes, I hope. Uh, I'll, I'll try and wrap up as soon as I can. Um, you know, somewhere in early 1990, uh, late 1990 perhaps, um, I saw over and over again in the newspaper, the uh, sentiment expressed by those who wanted Babri Masjid to be pulled down. Uh, and they, they used a particular expression. They said, it's a monument of national shame. It's a monument of national shame. Now, the thing is, I just began to wonder, once you start labeling things like that, a monument of national shame, where will you stop? Because uh, in that case, then would you consider, because uh, the reason it was called a monument of national shame was because it's built by uh, a, a foreigner from another religion or whatever. And there was a suspicion that it was built over after demolishing something. A similar suspicion was expressed about the Taj Mahal as well. So would you want to pull that down too as a monument of national shame? The British built the railway system in this country, uh, uh, primarily to carry the loot uh, from in, within the country to the ports. Will you pull that down too, uh, calling that a monument of national shame? Uh, where, where, where does this stop? It's a kind of uh, you know, infinite regress. And you can go all the way back to the past and you will always find that no matter how heroic or how noble some personage from the past is, you can always find faults and problems with it. So that's the issue. Uh, now, the history of the iconoclasts, for example. Now, here again, uh, we, we had uh, looked at 
the uh, Bamiyan Buddha statues being pulled down. Now, earlier in Europe, uh, also you had, uh, uh, when the Puritans came on the scene, they felt that all the crosses and uh, statuary in the churches and the Gothic churches in England and so on were all uh, idols uh, and uh, they had to be pulled down because Christian worship had to be Spartan and the uh, Christian worship space had to be free of any distractions that might uh, tempt you to uh, you know, invest your devotion on an idol instead of on the invisible God. Uh, and so, they, so the thing is, there's always been this uh, conflict between visual uh, cultures and verbal cultures, you know, somehow the, the, those who are cultures of the word uh, say that uh, God is abstract and uh, invisible. And so on the other hand, those who are, who feel that you need a visual aid to, uh, you know, to, to relate to the deity. Uh, so there's been this conflict throughout history in different uh, parts of the, uh, of the world. Um, so, um, and then again, the question of who will you honor, you know, uh, one man's terrorist uh, can be another, uh, another man's freedom fighter. Uh, you know, one culture's terrorist could be another culture's freedom fighter. Now, the ambiguities go on and on. Um, it, look at the Columbus issue again. Now, the fact is that Columbus uh, was hailed as the discoverer of America and, and all of that, but uh, he was also a man who presided over one of the worst periods of genocide, you know, the Taino Indians, for example, or the uh, Caribs and the Arawaks and so on were massacred. Now, the, uh, until very recently, American students were not told that in their history books um, about Columbus. Now, the fact that sometime back in Chicago, they wanted to pull down the st statue of Columbus. The protesters went up, uh, did that, uh, tried to do that. But the thing is this, uh, wouldn't it, uh, you know, protests are wonderful and it's, uh, it's good in that sense, uh, correcting the ills of history. I would very much want, uh, in my view, uh, say, uh, if I were to organize the protest, I would uh, get people around the Statue of Columbus, have an exhibition of all his atrocities, have it there for about uh, maybe a week or so, and then, uh, you know, in a kind of relay kind of thing, post volunteers there from time to time to explain to guides that this man who's uh, praised here also has this other side to him you know he had this, or put a plaque there which shows the, both sides that this man was uh, in one sense uh, uh, an, uh, an adventurous person but in another sense he was uh, barbaric uh, you know ha let let public visiting public see both sides uh, you know it can be a public education there's also this whole question of the remembrance of the past you know milan kundera once said the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting which is why some unpleasant things have to be kept there for, so that people can remember, recall, uh, and uh, the horrors of the past so that those who forget the past are condemned to, re, uh, uh, to relive it, uh, you know, to repeat the mistakes of the past. So uh, as a kind of warning sign, so that's why you have the Holocaust museums and so on. You know, as a kid going to school, I we, we go past the statues of in Bangalore of Queen Victoria at one end of Covent Park and at Prince Ed, King Edward at the other end of Covent Park. And just when you turned the corner, you had Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, the thing is this, that uh, to say that you can pull them down because uh, of the hatefulness of the colonial period is one thing. The statues were actually beautiful. There's an aesthetic side to it too. But... Uh, instead of that, let the, the city decided the wi wisest thing to do would be <laughs> they just planted trees around uh, the statue of Queen Victoria. So now you can't see that the, the splendid vista that the British had in mind, you know, that you see it, see it from far away, gone. The trees block the whole thing. If you want to see it, you can come, uh, get in between the trees, then look at it as an object lesson in history. So I would uh, close with that and I would say, uh, you know, let's uh, make these places of educational, you know, uh, you know where, uh, what we call um, complex uh, places, that is places where the complexity is restored, that uh, both sides are given, uh, and, and let creative protests happen, you know, around statues, uh, demonstrations. So if you have a Columbus Day uh, celebration, gather people around the statue and distribute leaflets about how evil this fellow was, whose statue you're looking at. That will uh, create that sense of <laughs> ambiguity uh, also within uh, the audience. And eventually, I think uh, the, the fact that history is complex, uh, you know, that uh, the past has uh, both its uh, glories and its horrors, uh, and uh, that we, we ought to be people who will discriminate between them uh, as citizens going forward. I think. Uh, as public education, let let them let them be. Uh, you know, 
or uh, uh, if you want, uh, otherwise remove them, put them in museums. Uh, the, the, this idea of violence against uh, monumental buildings, you know, pulling them down, etc. Uh, you know, in the future, who, who, who you might, the hero of today might be pulled down tomorrow, you know, so uh, th I think that's not the way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alexander. Uh, I'd say a creative point that was made uh, regarding this creative protest in the interpretation of public education. I just have a very contrary question to this. Uh, um, you know, when you try and get this uh, kind of, uh, I'd say, universal scope where you present the for and against both, uh, let's imagine that this is the statue and this is the good points and the bad points uh, so that people have clarity. Who decides the right and the wrong? Because well, history is, is dynamic. Something that was right then is wrong now. What's right now will be wrong 10, 20 years later in the next decade. Yeah, yeah. is that a question to me? Yes, it yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, I, I, that's a difficult one because, uh, I, you know, I, it all, uh, you know, sometimes you just have to allow history to unfold the way it is. And in fact, uh, uh, whether you like it or not, regimes are always going to make changes uh, because they have power, you know, enormous power. Or sometimes corporations have that power. I believe corporations are the biggest power wielders today, power without accountability to the ordinary citizen, accountability only to shareholders. They can uh, call the shots on a whole lot of things, in fact. You know, uh, public advertisements, for example, which are also, in a sense, a certain kind of statuary in public space uh, in, in other forms. Uh, you, you know, many of these things ultimately, therefore, uh, you'll have to watch how it flows, uh, educate civil society. And so I'll give you one example. You know, I was uh, uh, walking down the street the other day and I saw uh, that uh, there was this attempt to, uh, you know, you had, uh, I think, Subhash Chandra Bose and you had Sardar Patel and you had, uh, uh, I think, uh, Head Gaver, uh, and, and, you know, the idea was to replace the old icons with uh, new ones and you know just uh, as a kind of uh, nod to you know some, some complexity one or two people from the past pantheon uh, of political leaders who were okay kind of uh, who passed muster uh, as far as this particular political configuration was concerned uh, sardar patel yes uh, and uh, subhash chandra bose yes gandhi oh, not so much nehru certainly not erase him uh, so this will keep happening. Uh, we just uh, have to w w wait and see. And I, th I think uh, uh, this kind of gymnastics in public space will keep happening. And uh, mo most of us often will have no control over this. Yeah. Thank Dr. you. Rido. I'll just go quickly. Got it. Thank you. I'll go quickly to Dr. Modrowski. And uh, in the opening remarks, you did mention about the intervention of law across various uh, countries that the kind of punishments people were. Uh, public policy makers were coming up with. Uh, on a contrary belief, do you think should there be a classification on which statue should probably stay based on the history or ideology and which should not? No, 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 I don't. Uh, because I, I believe that it is something that has to do with one's position and power. I think it's very, very difficult to get away from it. Uh, I think the educational motivations are very important. And the fact that uh, statues are used at points of education, they are in the United States. The name of a school student study, why is my school named Robert E. Lee School or something? They, so they do it. Uh, I believe that the type of punishment, it depends. Uh, what has happened, and this is an interesting point, is when, say, the fines or a jail sentence one has tried to impose, it becomes a point of protest in itself. So that what has really happened is people have kind of dropped it and said, okay, we're going to fine you for destruction of public property. But then the public comes out and says, and this is this case in the United States, but I'm the public and I don't want this statue. Who decided this statue should be here? Who decided that this is my space? So the short answer is no, I think there's another way to do it. 
And I think that uh, still orchestrating ways of education and expression also is not the answer because oftentimes people who have the power, who are on the boards of museums and municipalities often have, are in a position of power. Uh, it's different when there's an exchange of power, but I believe that using these events to educate and transform. I believe one of the keys should be transformation of the space, because if you stop with the destruction, then you're not going to go anywhere. You're going to lead to more destruction. But if you allow for transformation, I think that's important. Thank you, Kathleen. I think the word transformation and education is the key. Uh, that you are stressing. I'm going to go to Dr. Mehta here. And uh, I was reading this um, um, BBC research article and there's an interesting quote that I thought I'll pick up and maybe take your comments on it. I quote, it says, bringing down statues doesn't erase history. It makes us see it more clearly, unquote. Oh, well, yes. I think that uh, actually it puts into relief uh, uh, that which the statue uh, stood for. And, uh, you know, one has to ask oneself, uh, what, is, uh, what is achieved by an erasure? So if you are going to remove uh, a statue, or by the way, if you're going to remove a monument, what is going to be achieved by it? Now, I think we live in times of uh, Kalyug. And what's going to be achieved is only going to be uh, more and more, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, despair and pessimism. Uh, 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 that's uh, the sense that I have. Uh, I, and I take as my uh, point, uh, really, the uh, destruction of the Babri on 6th December 1992. And uh, that fundamentally, and that was a monument, that fundamentally altered uh, the character of this uh, republic, and there's no going back. There is no pre-Babri mo mode anyway available to us. Uh, so you have Babri, and if you are going to take the logic of that kind of disruption, then what you're going to find is an inexorable and inevitable movement towards Kashi and Mathura and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, so you know it's not going to achieve uh, much. Uh, uh, now, yes, uh, the Babri does not uh, exist anymore in uh, law now or in uh, as a material artifact. So where does it actually exist is what you have to ask yourself. And if you, uh, you know, we did a little survey and uh, began to look at uh, local Muslim uh, uh, societies uh, in uh, North India, the most important mosque is the Babri, but it doesn't exist. Now, what's the, okay, so what's the form of this existence? How does it incarnate itself? Now, this destruction incarnates itself only as an incredible and increasing oppression. I'm afraid that's, uh, uh, that's what happens. So if you are going to go down the route of uh, uh, destroying uh, statues, uh, and you are going to actually say that, oh, well, actually the past has not been uh, erased, you're absolutely right. In fact, what is going to happen is that the past is going to uh, uh, acquire a new kind of agency and a greater validity. That's what happens. Uh, it's, it's, that's the way in which it works. That's how I understand it. Got it. Dr. Klammer, in the beginning, you had uh, mentioned that you're not really a big fan of statues, and so are many protesters around there who've, uh, you know, that is the very reason that they've been writing petitions and protesting, because they're not a fan of these statues and their ideologies either. Do you think that proper in place of laws and policies by the legal departments of countries in, in when they're in proper format could actually hold down this uh, uh, break of war and violence? Oh, good, good question. <laughs> I mean, the, the money, as, as in a way, as Professor Ma Dr. Mehta say, I mean, memorialization to take various, various forms. Um, and let me just introduce a slightly different answer. It's not, I'm not sure it's a very good answer to your, your question, which is, Question of humor. 
Now I can't I can't recall the the locations off offhand where I where I've seen this, but I, I've come across two or three occasions on which artists had simply dressed up statues. Nobody torn them down. Nobody you know smashed them up or thrown them in the harbor. And you know something as simple as a pair of dark glasses looks just wonders. I mean, you if you really want to transform Queen Victoria, just just put a pair of sunglasses on her statue, and and it's totally different. And I've seen a number of artists do this, you know, with with you know woolly woolly beanies or you know sunglasses or or some other kind of garment, which I think is not necessarily trivial. I think I think it can be a way in which you 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 accept the existence of that of that of that monument of that particular statue, but you you entirely approach it in a different way with a kind of lack of reverence, if you like. Okay. Which transforms it, and I think it transforms it in ways which then become much more congruent with these changes of, Kathleen was saying, nature of public space, for example. Um, so, the other question I'm sure again is if that was also what you were implying was that all these these questions about decisions: who puts these things up and who puts these things down, who takes these things down. Um, I think we have to accept now that almost always those questions become very intensely political. I mean, if you think about uh, the issues about the design of the, the uh, World Trade Center, you know, if it's to be reconstructed, if so, in what form, or should it be nothing? Should I think one plan was indeed to have nothing, uh, a bit like I think was somebody was planning to do at Bamiyan, which was simply to have a kind of hologram, you know, to project uh, an, an image, but with no actual building present. And I believe there was at least one NGO was doing that with, with Bamiyan, was, you know, projecting an image of the statues into the niches where the originals had been destroyed. So I think, I think, I think you can, we can open this up beyond the question of, you know, to have statues, not to have statues, you know, to overthrow them or not, not to overthrow them. You can transform them in different ways. And I think that that makes it a, a kind of a fun thing to do in, in a way as well, when, when you can. And even in the case of someone like, I don't know about Mr. Colson, whether it would work in Bristol, um, you know, it, it does change the, the quality of, a, of, an, of an image or a representation when, when in fact you can, you can read it in other ways. Something which has been taken very seriously in the past can possibly be displaced into a different kind of space, whether aesthetically or politically. And, and that itself transforms. And I think the things that Joanna was talking about, you know, how to keep the statue physically you know, nobody wants to melt it down, I guess, but to create different messages around it so that it can be read in different ways. And I think that open reading is one of the ways to approach any kind of monument. Got it. Thank you, Dr. Klammer, for your opinion, views on that. Uh, uh, we're about to reach the end of the debate and I'm going to get Dr. Mm -hmm. Brown for this. Mm -hmm. uh, what a time that we're doing this debate because uh, it is um, the Edward Colston uh, court hearings that have been going on for quite a while. And um, this morning I was uh, reading a, a, a piece of a, a story that was uh, published by Daily Mail, which talks about one of the protesters uh, uh, on, uh, under the trials mentioning in court that um, it is an act of love and not uh, violence that he committed for his uh, uh, fellow men. So it's more of a debate that's coming in around a war versus love situation. Um, I'd love to get your views on that, Dr. Brown. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I, I have no doubt that his, I, I really believe that his commitment will have been through an act of love. So I think that makes perfect sense to me. He's expressing a sense of love towards people and correcting correcting what he sees in, as an injustice in the statue remaining there. The question that we've been talking about, well, okay, so yes, in Bristol, the Colston statue had lots of guerrilla interventions. Also, there was uh, somebody put a red ball and chain around his feet for a while. He had his face whitewashed. Occasionally there were cones put on his head. There were other statues put around him. So people did a lot of those interventions. The thing that didn't work with that is that there still remained the fact that the state speech was not critical. And so there was nothing coming from the, you know, officially what was being done was the preservation of a statue. And so there was a sense that you had to be constantly doing something in order to disrupt the message that was perceived as 
being conveyed through the through that preservation. And so I think although there's um, there there are ways to recontextualize that are successful, often they're quite crude. A lot of what people do with these kinds of Guerrilla recontextualizing, guerrilla recontextualizing is often very harsh speech, um, and I think it's it's interesting to think about. The, I like the kind of humorous examples you gave, but I do think that there's a need for the the state. Like there needs to be something that is official that is blocking the message or complicating the message, or um, you know. And I guess the thing that we haven't talked about at all, really, is what these protests are really for. So we've talked a lot about statues, but. I think really what the, the thought behind these protests is you find something that is symbolizing that kind of, um, you find a symbol to put pressure on, where if you then put pressure on that, it casts a light on all of the other inequalities that are in society. It's a lever for opening up much wider conversations around inequality. And certainly when the Colston statue came down in Bristol, it was phenomenal it was just phenomenal what happened in that moment, the amount that changed across British society, at least the conversations that were happening in institutions from the smallest level to the highest level. It was just incredible how much people shifted and what they were trying to accomplish. And um, so there's, I think there's, there's a question to ask whether you're for it or against, the, for challenging statues or against it or whatever. How do we take this moment, this, where this huge platform has been generated, a huge amount of attention has been generated. How do we use that moment to really leverage much larger steps that repair the, the inequalities that we have today? There's a chance to like use this moment to motivate that. And that really depends on follow through uh, and artful follow through. And I think that's where we should be directing attention now is in those reparative directions. Dr. Alexander, I think you have something to add. Uh, you know, th there's also this whole question that um, people put up statues uh, as a way of uh, expressing new uh, identities and uh, new quests for dignity. In India, for example, um, wherever you go, uh, especially uh, where, where there are uh, Dalit people, uh, you know, groups uh, living together, either in slums or uh, living uh, in small concentrated groups, you have a statue of Ambedkar. That's their way of expressing uh, their identity, and it's uh, you know. Some, and those who oppose that sometimes uh, desecrate the statue, not so much by pulling it down, but uh, you know, on the sly when no one's looking. You know, sometimes put in a garland of <laughs> footwear or something, and then that provokes a whole lot of tension. We've seen that time and again. There's also this whole question of the sense that of humiliation uh, that a people are made to feel about the past. Now, the thing is this, that the past, long after it is over, sometimes uh, there, there is this awareness of uh, some kind of, we have been humiliated, you know, and so we've got to make good. And so some of that expresses itself in this form of uh, outrage. But, you know, just if a long period of time passes, then things mellow down actually uh, in many places. For example, in Britain, a good deal of the tourism, uh, you know, is directed at uh, Roman monuments. Uh, the British were once humiliated by Roman rule, but they proudly show off the Roman monuments and every uh, with very lovingly archeologists dig up these things. So as after a long period of time has passed, even the conquerors, uh, uh, you know, material remains begin to become now so much a part of uh, the landscape of the past, of history, and uh, those sharp edges wear off with time, you know. So I would think that that's inevitable and bound to happen. Thank you. I was just coming there uh, because we are proceeding towards our concluding remarks and in about a minute or two each, uh, maybe Maybe let's all take a philosophical perspective and answer this question that what purpose do statues serve and how can these statue wars be um, uh, avoided? Let's, let's start with Dr. John Clamour. Um, there we are, thank you. Well, I think, I think other panelists have may answer, answer the questions in, in a way. I think Dr. Cherry just did in a way, I mean, Sometimes they're simply glorification, you know, historic, historic victories of some sort. I mean, I often wonder what my French friends think when they go to London 
you know, and in the middle of London, of course, is Trafalgar Square with the column with Nelson. Admiral Lord Nelson on top, yeah. right? <laughs> um, which is a, I suppose, a you know, permanent provocation in a way to any French person, right? Nobody, nobody suggested tearing down Nelson's column, as far as I know, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so, I mean, there's glorification, you know, that attempt to keep glorious historical memories from your point of view alive, okay? But I think this question of identity is also, is also a very important point there, as, as Dr. Cherry has pointed out. I mean, it, it is a way in which people would want to, um, you know, give a sense of concreteness, I think, to that identity. And I think the case of Anne Bedkar statues actually is a very good one because that, that does quite literally kind of make concrete something um, which, which goes beyond, you know, verbal, verbal propaganda, verbal, verbal ways of trying to express your identity. You, you, and I, th I think there's probably, I'm you know, not a psychologist, but I suspect there's always a psychological need there. There is the desire to to give a, a, f a rather formal sense to to a, 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 an identity, whether it's because you're you know you're pushing your kind of glorious victories or something, or whether because in fact you're drawing attention to the fact that you are marginalised in some way. This 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 doesn't quite allow people to ignore you because there is a visual representation of yourself, of your status, of, of and, and people, of course, can read that perfectly well and, and know what it refers to. So I think there are multiple levels to this, of course, as well. Um, and I guess it keeps a lot of bad artists in, uh, in work as well. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Mehta, would you like to add to that? I agree entirely with uh, what John is saying that, uh, and you say that in addition to uh, the commemorative function of uh, statues that they fix identity, they mark the past in a particular way and so on. I think that uh, sometimes uh, uh, statues are also signs of uh, the great lie that we live. And uh, statues also do that. So it's not merely uh, about uh, something that uh, exists but something one hopes existed, you know, and uh, uh, and I think that uh, uh, perhaps we could sort of uh, also begin to think about uh, the notion of uh, of the lie that is actually built into ideas of uh, statues, because uh, you know these personages were complicated; they were complex people, as uh, uh, Joanna has uh, uh, pointed out. They were complex. They were both uh, great uh, philanthropists and they were engaged in slave trade, if you want, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, so how does one, uh, what's the gloss that happens? I think there is a, there is a deliberate uh, uh, line that goes on over there and that we all collectively agree to participate in the lie. I think that's sometimes that's what happens with uh, uh, statues. Mm. Thank you. No, but, little, but, word, but word, just... little word, because your, your point about the lie reminded me a long, long time ago, I was, I, I, I got to meet uh, the famous French social theorist Derrida, Jacques Derrida, uh, who came to, I was on leave at that time, and I was in Oxford, he came to give a lecture, and the title of the lecture was The State of the Lie and the Lie of the State. I thought that was a rather nice title, which summed up actually quite a lot of things we're talking about tonight. <laughs> Sorry to interject that suddenly. But... No, I think that's a very good intervention. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, just last question, and it's, uh, the floor is open for anybody to answer. I was just uh, uh, taking in point from Mr. Mehta, I was wondering that uh, what are statues at the end of the day? And when, when I think, uh, uh, when, I, when I'm reading my his, history or geography book as a, as a 10 or 11 year old, I see these statues as, as glorious, uh, um, uh, you know, movements, as glorious momentary uh, uh, establishments that have done something of heroic or leadership quality. But as I grow up, I see that the meaning has changed over the years. And now that we're doing this debate, I realize that uh, the, mean, the interpretation that we hold will keep changing in the years to come. Would you agree to that? I would uh, think think so because the, uh, there's, there, there are these other the, uh, we talk about the ambivalence of not just the past but uh, not just of movements not just of institutions but also of individuals you see so uh, to give you another example Alfred Nobel um, who instituted the Nobel prizes 
nobody is going to protest. Very rarely do you find someone uh, rejecting a Nobel Prize because of all that's involved, because the man invented dynamite. But remember, it was an act of remorse on his part. And uh, by honoring that remorse, as it were, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, uh, see that institution of the Nobel Prize as a positive thing. You know, uh, here was a man who felt remorse. So even today, how many uh, philanthropies are being done by companies that are ravaging the environment, oh. you see? Uh, so on the one hand, you destroy nature. On the other hand, you hand out, uh, <laughs> you know, largesse. So uh, we'll never get out of these ambiguities, you know, and best thing to do would be to educate civil society about these. So that's why I said the creative protests, which should be more educative around statues. Uh, you know. Thank you. Good. Dr. Modorski wants to add to that. Yeah, um, I want to say that, you know, the people who are, if you spoke about education in the schools, uh, I have found, at least in the United States, uh, the greater the entree into education, and by that I mean uh, teachers, educators who are from the oppressed classes, the broader your uh, reading of statues, of the things like the name of a school. For example, a book that's very important, Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States. It's not an accident that it's been banned from many of the other schools that are really taken over by white supremacists. So I believe it's a process of transformation education. Just one little point is uh, creating new spaces. I'm thinking of um, the mural artists and Basquiat who took over, and Bansky has done it also in a way, taken over public spaces in a very different way to the point that people in the metros of New York are very pleased to see their point of view, you know, their class struggles that are expressed in murals. And um, I think that finding alternative spaces for expression is really important. Thank you very much, Dr. Modorski, for your views. It's uh, been a wonderful evening to uh, uh, have this discussion. But before we conclude, we have uh, Dr. Brown uh, to add. I won't be too long, but I want to pick up on this question, the point about education, because I think that's a wonderful note to end on. I think it's completely possible to take these debates and, and step past the culture wars. I don't think we have to stay in the culture wars. I think there are ways in which we're exacerbating them by having harsh speech on all sides. And I think there's some ways of sequencing what we do that can make it actually quite easy for people to absorb the messages because people do want to. So I'll give you two toolkits to go away and explore. Um, the first is by educationalist Brie Pickauer. So she has a paper called Six Elements of Social Justice Curriculum Design. She says, when we look at these difficult history, often the temptation is just to leap into the most difficult history, find the gnarliest, most horrible thing that's happened and dive in and start ranting about it. And that just make, has the effect of making people very nihilistic or defensive or depressed or overly <laughs> righteous. She said, we should instead always start with something that primes people for self-love, then something that primes people with a sense of respect for difference. And only once you've got people well resourced with those emotions and those kind of contacts with themselves and with each other, then you look at something difficult from history. Then you look at how ordinary and iconic people came together to overcome that. And then you do something concrete, you give people something concrete to do um, to change something today. And I think that structure is just a beautiful one and it's how we should, you know, you can use it to transform these conversations. Um, there's a project that I've been working on called Bridging Histories, which I'd love for you all to look at. It's www.bridginghistories.com. And it's basically kind of packaging that into this participatory public education project where we're getting people to do six activities based on those and then share what they make up into this public gallery. And then you can have your difficult conversations about history somewhere in the middle, but it's in the context of celebrating each other and making a positive change. And I think if we do this, you know, there's no culture war here and you make loads of progress. And the other, the other resource I would give is the Four Truths Framework from South Africa. Um, so this is when you're looking at these difficult bits of history, there is there are these four truths 
to any of them. So one is forensic truth. What are the detailed facts, descriptive facts about what happened? We can argue about those. The next is personal truth. What does that history mean to you personally? The next is social truth. What's the tapestry of meanings across a society? And finally, healing or reconciliatory truth. So what are the true insights you can come to that can help you grow from that? And if you find ways to represent all of those, uh, and it can be done very concisely, but to represent all of those in those spaces, then I think you know a lot of growth is possible. I turn protests into dialogues. Mm -hmm. Don't protest into dialogue. That's that's the closing line we are picking up. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, what a fantastic, comprehensive, and well-discussed uh, debate uh, this has been. Of course, there's no end to this dialogue, as, as we just discussed. Uh, but uh, thank you so much, panelists, for joining us and to our viewers who have uh, uh, logged in. Uh, keep uh, tuned into Argumentative Indians. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn as we come up with more such interesting debates. Thank you. 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 Thank you.